How are we doing today? Good. A couple of you are doing fine. Some of you are quite silent. Uh, how are we today? There we go. All right, good. Well, we've got to get some engagement every once in a while. That's the whole point of us trying to have fun. Sometimes on a Sunday morning, I see some people in their uh, Chiefs gear. Anybody in here? Yeah, there's a few people. All right. What about some Eagles fans? Anybody? Okay, good. All right. No, I don't care. I really don't care. I, uh, team, my root for is never going to make it to the Super Bowl again, and that's okay. But today, you'll have a great opportunity to uh, uh, hang out with some people who do enjoy it. Uh, and usually, my, my bend on this thing is whichever team I like the least is who I root against. But I don't really care today. Uh, I don't have a team I like the least. Uh, so I'm going to have fun with some friends. Hopefully, you do too as well. And I think there's some challenges when it comes to a day like this. Because there are opportunities, if you're bringing people into your home and enjoying these uh, moments of fun, food, fellowship, all that uh, good F stuff, all right? We're going to get into some more F stuff here in just a minute. I hope that makes sense. That sounds weird leaving it like that, but we'll get there, I promise. Um, Listen, I have in in my life, um, actually last week I I explained a little bit, if you weren't here with us, we opened up this book of Acts, Uh, and we're doing this study that's going to take us pretty much the remainder of the year. Now we'll sprinkle in some other things uh, on and off uh, but and kind of do this in chunks and sections. And we'll do about six or seven weeks here at the beginning in the book of Acts. But I've had some time that I've been able to wrestle uh, with things in the book of Acts. Uh, going to a Bible college, uh, you, one of your required courses, here, here's the cool thing about Bible college, is that we don't have math and science. So it's like, yeah, man, that's, that's good stuff. For me, I'm not a science guy, uh, but, but I like the history stuff, and I like different things, especially I'm not good at math, so when our kids ask us about that, I'm like, you have a teacher for a reason. I, you know more than I know ever, but, but I did get to, I had some get-to opportunities. I get some different history classes that people don't get when they go off to different universities, so whether it's Old Testament history, which is what I love when we went through the book of Genesis, a lot of that Old Testament history comes back into play, and then there's Acts which is essentially a New Testament history. This church in development, basically, is what's going on. Uh, The very first church and the history of the church. And and last week we introduced it. I'll kind of sprinkle in some background a little bit more here in a bit. But I've wrestled with the book of Acts over the years a a lot. Um, I'm a guy, so I got out of college in 2002. Anybody born after that in here? I figured there might be a couple. Okay, there's a couple. Uh, it, uh, man, that's crazy. Uh, anyway, but, but I think it was 2008 whenever this, uh, this little book came out called Crazy Love. Anybody ever hear of that book? Little bitty book. It was awesome. It was like that much, and I could read that thing, and uh, it really just changed my perspective on things. Because as I went through the book of Acts and read and studied through the book of Acts, I had some thoughts, and I thought, oh, it's a history, it's a narrative, there's some things going on. But when I read that book, uh, it really, the the author Francis Chan kind of pointed you to uh, a reality uh, of the book of Acts that I just got, I got excited about. And and I I end up getting this vision of what could be. I say that, I don't want to be weird on this whole vision stuff, but in my mind, when in a leadership capacity, when I say vision, what I'm talking about is, hey, this is what we're going to shoot for, this is what we're going to try to be. Uh, I, I didn't have some word uh, given to me like, this is what is going to happen, but this is what we're going to shoot for. So in 2008, I had this little small group that I was meeting with at the time, and I think we even went through that book, Crazy Love, and, uh, and actually really start kind of stirring our hearts and figuring out who Jesus wanted his followers to be as a church. And I just fell in love with this idea of this whole utopian mentality, like, man, things are going to be awesome. It's going to be raw. We're going to get people uh, pointed towards each other um, better than they've ever been pointed towards, uh, you know, because we live pointed towards ourselves all the time. And and we're going to give away stuff, and we're going to share our possessions, and and we're going to solve world hunger, and and we're going to do all these things that look like a church in in a way that it's never looked. Now, the the younger 28-year-old version of myself truly believes this, right? Uh, th- this is exactly what I think Jesus was calling us towards whenever he lays out, wh- whenever we see it laid out in the book of Acts. Like These early followers of Jesus are doing things in a way that no believers had ever done before and, and probably ever since. 
and it was so raw, and, and, and it was so enticing. Like, this would change our families. This would change who we are. And, and I really thought, this is what we're going to do now. It didn't go exactly the way that I had visioned and, and had planned. I was just some young, dumb youth minister at the time. Didn't know what I was doing. Still don't know what I'm doing half the time. But in 2011, when I got this call uh, about an opportunity to come and, and be a leader of a, a small little church plant satellite that, uh, that we're in right now, uh, 11 years ago, I got this re-envisioned, that kind of reignited fire. I was like, okay, this is our chance. I'm older. I'm so much wiser. Uh, we're going to get this figured out, and it's going to look like the way Jesus wanted it to look like. And, and that, was, that was my hope, and that was my goal. That was the vision that I really, truly, and, I, and I'm not joking around, I had it for this church. Like, I, as a kid, was a part of a church in Kuwaita that I had, maybe had some opinions, like, man, they didn't have it all figured out. And a lot of churches, in my mind, felt like they weren't being authentic and, and people weren't truly experiencing Jesus the way they could through his people, not just from some pastor up on a stage. And I thought, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to break some barriers. We're going we're gonna to change some things. We're going to have this fresh start in this community. I, I grew up in this community, and this was going to provide a vehicle for us to just be real and be honest and, and, and be the church that God wants us to be. And this journey we've been on, over the past 11 years, hasn't exactly panned out the way I, I thought. Uh, because it's hard. It's hard to be the church. It's hard to be what Scripture prescribes. It's hard to be what uh, Jesus truly called us to be because we got so much culture in the way. And, and, and when we have that in the way, sometimes I think what we try to do is compartmentalize. Well, we got our church lives over here, and we got our real lives over here. And the reality is, Jesus just says, those things got to mesh together. And, and if they don't, then you're always going to be pushing up against culture in a way that it's just not going to work. And the reality is just going to, it's going to frustrate you as a leader like myself. It's going to frustrate you as a Jesus follower for all your years that you might have been one or for all those days that you might have been one. It's going to frustrate you if you think uh, that you can live these two different things. But I, I think what God calls us to do is something completely different. And that's why when I get to the book of Acts, I see this, and I just wonder, how? How did this happen? What, what, is, what is going on here? And what's crazy is, um, when, when I thought all these things could happen, and I talk, and I get kind of jazzed up with people who really have this vision for the church as well. They, they don't have to be a pastor or leader of the church. But what happens is, yeah, you know, I remember back in the old days, this is what we did, and this, this happened. And, and what we tend to do, people who have been around for a while, and and I'm not throwing arrows specifically at you if you think this way, but just kind of at you, because uh, I do it too, right? But in the old days, things were great. Man, we had Sunday morning service, and then we had Sunday school classes, and then we had Sunday night uh, Bible study, and then a midweek Wednesday night, and everything was just rocking and rolling, and everything was perfect, right? We were solving world hunger back then. We were giving away everything as people had need back then, right? We, we were doing everything we could to be the Christians that we were called to be. But, and I think, like, if we really just backed up and like, you know what? It wasn't all that, it wasn't all as it cracked up to be. But what we do is we end up worshiping and, and just idolizing these methods. We think that this foolproof method of doing church is the way it was supposed to be. And even in the book of Acts, we'll get to a method here in a little bit. Even, in, even there, we're not, the, we're not called to do these methods. We're called, it's not about a foolproof method. It's about, and this is what I meant by F word. It's about being a family. And I think that's what people really long for. Back in the church of the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, or even the, the 20s as we are now. What, what I think the church is called to be is just pure family. And and I know that's hard. Anytime you get more than a handful of people, it's hard to be a family. We're going to talk about how you can make that happen a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about why it worked for them back in the, uh, we talk about 33 after AD. This 30 chunk years, uh, the book of Acts was going on. They're figuring out what it means to be the church. And they look like a family in ways that we really don't do very well today. And it and it's not going to matter if you got a program on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or, or if you got a Sunday school. It's, that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is 
Are we being obedient to Jesus? And bottom line, this is what we have to hit at today. This hearkening back to the good old day stuff, I don't, I'm not trying to be rude. I don't, I don't want to, like I said, I'm not trying to you know, shoot, fi- shoot fiery arrows at anybody. We're not doing that. But what we have to do is just take an honest assessment of that church wasn't necessarily all what it was cracked up to be because we didn't do everything. It was the family that I think we all long for. And some of you have been a part of churches like that, right? I can think back to my earliest church that I was ever a part of as a young kid, and there was a true f- sense of family. And you knew who uh, you could go to battle with. And I think about my first youth group, being involved in a youth group, and that really is what connected me to a church is because we loved each other, and, and our, our minister loved us, and, and we were honest and genuine with each other. Those methods have come and gone, but it's the family that you always go back to. So when you're searching, you're looking for what is that secret sauce, that utopian reality, it's, it's family. Bottom line, that's what it is. Now, some family, uh, I understand, can be dysfunctional and messes things up in our mind of, well, I don't want that. Uh, no, you don't want your family. You want a church family. You want a place to belong. And, and this is exactly what the church was intended to be. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. So when we started last week, here's what we said. It started with ordinary people, you and me, just like you and me. Not superheroes, uh, nobody with any special gifts or calling, no, no it's more special than any others, right? It, it just was people who were responding to the, to the will of God, to the challenge, to, the, to, the, to Jesus' push for us to be more than we already are. That's what it was always about. And that's how things took off. And uh, these ordinary people are doing ordinary things. And that's what I want to look at today is, is how these ordinary followers became an extraordinary family, became something more extraordinary than they ever thought that they could be on their own. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to spend some time unpacking the back half of Acts chapter 1. If you weren't able to be with us last week in verses 1 through 11, it's a quick, I'm sure, 30-something minute message that you can go catch up on, right? That's all I do. Um, Anyway, but today we're going to bounce off of this mission statement in verse 8 where Jesus called these followers and said, you need to go and you need to be my witness in Jerusalem, the specific core city, in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, okay? That's simply what he called his followers to do. That's it. Nothing too crazy, just be a witness. You don't have to have all the answers. Just tell about what Jesus did in your life and about how extraordinary your experience was with him. So, what happened was you had these 40 days after Jesus had died on a cross, was buried, and rose from the grave three days later, right? And then there was this 40-day period after Jesus rose and before he ascended. And what we finished off with last week is there was this moment after 40 days where Jesus literally ascends into the clouds, ascends into heaven. Now, that'd be some kind of sight, right? That, that might change your view of who Jesus is, like, oh, okay, if I didn't believe the whole rose from the grave thing is, I can't deny that. <laughs> Something, something's going on here, and I need to get into action. This is what happened, and this is kind of the beginnings of the church. If you just take a minute, you just think about it. It's, that's incredible. It's fascinating on what happened there. But now you have this promised Messiah that the Jews were waiting for is that it didn't just, oh, he didn't just go to a cross and have all these great teachings, but he rose This risen Christ now changed everything. And it was that experience that they had with Jesus that changed the way that they moved on forevermore. So that's where we are. And now let's go ahead and read verse 12. And I'm just going to read a big chunk. Sometimes I'll go verse by verse. Sometimes I just want to read something. Uh, We're just going to read through the rest of chapter 1 together. I may interrupt myself a few times. You know how I might do this. But let's check it out. Verse 12 says that these followers then returned to Jerusalem. Okay, that, like I said, I'm going to interrupt myself. You got to see this first off. That, that seems like nothing, but that is complete and total obedience. How do we know that? Because what were they told to do? Go be my witnesses where? To Jerusalem. So the first act that they had after seeing Jesus ascend into heaven is that they returned to Jerusalem. That was obedience. Okay, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, this Mount of Olives. This is where he ascended, uh, which is near Jerusalem. 
only a Sabbath day journey away. They couldn't walk very far um, on Sabbath, and this, this wasn't very far away. Verse 13, and when they had entered Jerusalem, they went up to the upper room. Notice that it says the upper room. I'm curious if it was the same upper room that he had already had this experience with before. I don't know exactly what's going on. I just kind of assume. Uh, but they were staying there. Here's who it was. These ordinary people, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, that's a religious zealot, uh, and Judas, the son of James, not the Judas that betrayed Jesus, okay? We'll get to him in a minute. All these, all these followers, with one accord, were devoting themselves to the prayer, to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, okay? So it's not just the remaining 11 who are here in the supper room. You have more people. Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, more women, probably Mary and other, other women as well, another Mary, uh, and then his brothers, which were skeptic at one time about who Jesus was. Keep that in mind. But this is what it says in 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. Basically, he's just putting a blanket term. This is what Luke's saying. All the believers, the company of persons was in all about 120. So think about this. We think a lot of times whenever we talk about the disciples, and this is who Jesus showed up to after he rose from the grave, you've got these 12, and then he convinced them, and Thomas said, oh, I want to see the nails in, or the holes in your hands, and, and that's what he did, right? Yeah, but there were more. There were more people. So think about it like there could have been 12 chosen among us, chosen, named by Jesus. I want you to come and follow me. But he couldn't stop the rest of the crowds that were coming around. There were a, a room full so if this was the upper room and we fit about 120 people in here, imagine the, the, the close, compact family unit that's going on there. This is, this is what's happening. Okay, I'm going to stop interrupting myself. Brothers, this is what Peter said. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. That's King David of old, okay? Concerning Judas, the one who just betrayed Jesus, who became a guide, Judas, became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, one of the twelve, and was allotted his share in this ministry. And Peter realizes that his ministry was important, okay? Just because he did wrong doesn't mean it wasn't important before. Now, this man acquired a field, talking about Judas, with the reward of his wickedness, that 30 pieces, right? And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. What an awesome verse right there. Anyway. This is, these are the moments I wish our junior high boys were in here. Like, this stuff is interesting, guys. All right. Anyway, <laughs> burst open in the middle, and all his, his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that, the, so that field was called, in their own language, Akeldamo, that means field of blood. I wonder why. And it wasn't just the blood that came out, but it was the blood money that he bought it with. So think about it that way. For it is written in the book of Psalms, okay? Back to that David part. David wrote this, May his camp become desolate and let there be no one <clears throat> to dwell in it. And, another psalm, let another take his office. So you see what's going on here? He's talking about, we'll, we'll break that down in a minute. Uh, verse 21, so one of the men who, have, <clears throat> this, is, this is Peter and his leadership, says, so one of the men who have accompanied us uh, during all the time that, Lord, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, just happened, right? One of these men who was with us the whole time must become a witness to his resurrection. Witness. And Peter thinks, we, we need someone else to fill this role. And they put forward two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and then Matthias. And they prayed, and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in ministry above uh, and the apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, a lot going on there. It, it, it's, it feels like it might be unnecessary, but I would say nothing in the Bible is ever unnecessary. It might not have equal weight, but it always has equal importance, okay? This is important, and we'll break down a little bit why. Because I believe, it points back to what I was talking about from the very beginning. This points to family. You're like, what do you mean it points to family? Well, we're going to break this down. This points to an extraordinary group of followers of Jesus that become a family. 
that becomes something where they realize they belong. And, and, and the way it breaks down in here, you start to see these characteristics, these traits of a family. This is what makes a great family, and this is what makes a great church. And if we are to desire, just like young 28-year-old Ryan Finkhauser was, of what a church could be, it's this. And let me explain what this is, okay? One of the things that we see from the very beginning here, actually about verse 14, uh, it says one specific phrase we got to hang on to. It says, and they were with one accord. They were all together in one accord. Now, that doesn't mean that all 120 followers are like a clown car going through a Honda Accord. What this means is they are like in community. Actually, accord means they were in unity with one another. Everything that they'd done, they are all together. Now, now remember this. These followers, these same people that were named, Peter, James, John, all these other disciples as well, these are the same people who were fighting and bickering throughout the ministry of Jesus. This three-year period where they're going around and Jesus is teaching all these great and wonderful things and healing all these people in ways that they'd never seen before. At the same time, they're fighting and arguing. Hey, uh, Master, who's going to be the one that sits up to you next in heaven? Who's, who among us is going to be the greatest? Peter's over here denying him. and There's a, a lot of dis connect going on between these people. Now they're in one accord. Now they're in full unity. And, 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 and really the only way that we understand why that happened was because of their experience with Jesus. That's the only thing that can happen. Like, yeah, they walked with the, with the Lord, with the Son of God, day in, day out, which all of us like, man, I wish I would have walked with Jesus. Yeah, that's great, but you still would have been fighting and bickering, right? That you still would have been, whenever little children came up to see Jesus, they're like, hey, hey, he didn't have time for you. This, this is what we do. This is how wicked and evil our hearts are at times. But when you experience Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes, and they become this family that we really don't understand. We don't know because some of our experience with Jesus, we have so much else just getting in the way of that. Matthew's still a tax collector. Peter is still a denier. Yet You have Simon still a religious zealot. All these things that are going on. Yet they all have unity. They have one purpose, one accord. They're united together as a family. And we see this repeated throughout the book of Acts. This is what I love about this. You have this example here, but it happens again and again. In Acts 2, we see that they devoted themselves to... They, they were devoted to each other, and, and, and they met together daily. They were, they were devoted to being together. There was a community. Uh, we see a similar picture in Acts 4 where it says that they were together in one heart and one mind. And with that one heart and one mind, they sold everything they had and, and gave it away. And, and people were blessed because of it. They, this is something that doesn't just happen on our own. It, it's only something that happens with ex this extraordinary experience with Jesus. And what I see here, when we're talking about family, and talking about what followers of Jesus looks like, this is an extraordinary community. And this is what he longs for us today. It, we don't have to be prescriptive to everything they do, but you need to know this. Community is absolutely something we need to do. It was never meant to be me and Jesus, you and Jesus. It was always meant to be us and Jesus. Always. From the very beginning in Genesis 1, us, let us. You're, you're not, it's not good for man to be alone. It, it's always supposed to be community, and it always will be community. So if you don't experience community right now, and you don't have those experiences with God that you wish you had, give community a chance. Give unity a chance. This, this is great that we come in here and we are able to do this and we can all nod our heads together every once in a while. Yeah, I believe that about Scripture. That's great. But you know what's even better? What's even better is four hours later, whenever I'm hanging out with a small group of people that I love and cherish, and they challenge my thoughts about what I feel and see in Scripture, about where I may see the Holy Spirit lead, about what my family might be experiencing in a way that they've already experienced community does that. And whenever you give yourself over to someone bigger than yourself or your own inner circle, your own family, that, that's whenever God truly changes the world around us. Because he sees people in one accord. It doesn't make sense that that guy that was just denying Jesus and that guy who was just doubting Jesus, they're all in one. That doesn't make sense. But when we experience Jesus together and we're one united front and we're changing neighborhoods together, like, oh, this is cool. This I want to be a part of. Tell me about this guy that you rally around. 
This is what happens. And this is what we have to understand with this extraordinary community. They were with one accord. And if you have never given yourself this chance today, get into the lives of other people. I know it's hard. I know that there are introverts out there like me. I get it. But if you don't ever experience and at least allow other people to speak truth into your life, understand that you speaking something into their lives is just as valuable or more valuable than you'll ever give it credit for. It has to happen for other people to experience Jesus. Ordinary people only become extraordinary because of their unity, because of community. So I want to challenge you to do that. Get connected with people in a group. Get connected with people in a class. Get connected with people in a ministry team. Maybe you don't want to sit around and do a Bible study. You don't have to. Listen, just have discussions or serve people together. You're seeing teams all the time. Spiritual growth happens best in community. That's what we believe here. One more thing about verse 14 is that you see themselves, or it says the passage, they, they were devoting themselves to prayer. So you have this one passage. They were in one accord, and they were devoting themselves to prayer. I think this one passage shows us something huge, two big things about what the early church looked like. If we have this ideal picture of church, it's unity and it's prayer, extraordinary prayer. Let, let, let's break this down. Let's figure out how exactly that happens. They, they are living life with Jesus, walking step by step with him for three years. And you know what happens? They see him praying all the time. They, they see him teaching about prayer. They ask him, how do we pray? They see him going away by himself, praying along mountainsides. He's always praying all the time. You think prayer was important to Jesus? Absolutely it was. So these guys said, you know what we should probably do? We should probably pray. It, it, we're going to figure this thing out. We should pray. And here's how I know they prayed. Um, I think that, well, number one, there, there was immediate obedience, and, and they're trying to figure out. I think there's a couple things we can guess what they're praying. One may be, hey, he just told us to go to Jerusalem and wait on this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know that sounds weird. Uh, I don't, don't want to get all into that again, but baptism of the Holy Spirit just means, hey, you wait, and it's going to come upon you. If you wait and don't do your thing, God will come upon you, and he's going to do his thing. All right, that's what's going on. So they're praying as they're waiting. There's a 10-day period that they're waiting. Next week, we'll see how that manifests, right, in, in the Pentecost. So they're praying about that, but they're also praying about some kind of administrative task, which might seem silly to us, but they're absolutely looking for direction from God. So they're like, oh, we're praying about what do we do about this Judas thing? How, how are we going to handle this situation? Honestly, it doesn't really matter what they were praying. All that matters is what they were doing, that they were praying. That's what matters, and this is what we need to do. We need to quit trying to figure it out and think about it and talk through it in our experience and just get on our knees and pray and allow God to speak some truths into our lives that we may not know, we may not understand, that only the Spirit of God will. That's what extraordinary prayer looks like. Here's the pattern in the book of Acts. This is what they're doing. It says that they were with each other all the time, and they're doing, every time we see them with each other, they're praying. Acts chapter 4, they prayed for the difficulty uh, of, to, to gain this courage to be a witness. That's what he asked them to do, right? To go be a witness? Well, they're praying for it in Acts 4. This is going to continue to be difficult to share the good news. They knew that was their mission, so they thought we should pray about this. We see in Acts chapter 2, this, uh, this idea of continuing to devote themselves to one another, but also to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer every time they get together. You, you wonder why we pray so much as a church? We believe in the power of prayer, and, and we need to be guided by his spirit and allow us to do something that's not just our idea, but his. Verse, or, or chapter 7, we see this guy named Stephen. We'll get to him later. But in the midst of being persecuted and stoned to death because of his faith, we see him praying. Any, anybody having some hard times that they're going through and, 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 and maybe being persecuted for your faith? Prayer better be the first thing that you're doing. Acts chapter 12, the believers praying for Peter while he's been imprisoned. Uh, more and more prayer. Acts chapter 13, we're introduced to Paul and we get this uh, missionary journey that he's about to go on for the first time. And there's this little church in Antioch where people were first called Christians, by the way. And, and it says that they were about to send him out and they're fasting and praying, showering this journey with prayer. 
Again, we see it in Acts 16. While he's on another journey, he's thrown in jail. Just like Peter and John were, he's thrown in jail. And now he's worshiping and praying in the middle of it. Ordinary people are only accomplishing the job of being the church through extraordinary things like prayer. That's the only way it happens. Extraordinary prayer has to be included in our life. And we need to be figuring out what he's doing through the midst of prayer. Uh, there's this little verse in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It took me a long time to memorize it. It says this, pray continually. That's it. I love memorizing that verse. Uh, actually, you want to get into a different version. It's even harder. It says pray without ceasing. There's three words in that one. Anyway, but I, I, that verse always resonated with me. How in the world does anybody pray without ceasing? Yeah, you talk about prayer and how important this is, Ryan, and that's fine, I understand this. But how do I attain to that? Pray without ceasing. Well, I, I don't think you just jump into the deep end. It's crazy. Yeah, you want to surrender your life to God and, and pray? Yes. But it's going to take some baby steps. And, and I would encourage you today, if it's such a huge ask to, to be able to pray without ceasing, understand, you have to start somewhere. You have to. So if you have finally said, I'm going to get into this rhythm of life of of getting and engaged in the Word. And maybe you're doing, anybody ever do these version plans or open up your version on your digital uh, device in some way? Uh, you do it first thing on the homepage. Uh, they have this uh, verse of the day. You guys seen this? Right? So there's a verse of the day. And that's pretty cool because like, God, I don't know what to read today. Well, guess what? They give you one right there. Uh, and then there's this little commentary about it. But here's what I love. And this is what I've recognized in the last couple months uh, is that they put this thing underneath and it's this guided prayer. You want to take a baby step, start here. Uh, and I'm telling you, this resource, just jump in. It's a free re resource for anybody to do. Jump in, and there's about a four- to five-minute guided prayer. God, I don't know what to pray for. Well, guess what? I can they'll swipe right here, and they'll tell you exactly what to do. Some of us all need a little bit of direction, right? There's nothing wrong with that. So how do you pray without ceasing? Well, you've got to start. Uh, and, and maybe just, and let me challenge you, just give it five minutes a day. If it's guided by somebody else, there's no, no shame in that. Give it five minutes a day. You know what five minutes a day looks like in a week? 35 minutes, right? You know what it looks like in a year? Over 1,800 minutes. That's, that's more prayer than you've ever even thought about in your life. But it happens, this without ceasing, this pray continually, happens by one step. You've got to start with something. And, and, and I just say, if you don't know how to do this on an individual level, again, let me point back to community. You have people in your life that will pray for you and with you and alongside you. And this is what I love about being a part of a group is when we dive into prayer, when we start praying for the lost people in our lives, we start praying for the hurting, the sick, the whoever, this, this happens best in community. All right, let's get to this big chunk, okay? I'm not going to break down every verse of this, but it, this big chunk starting in verse 15, it, it becomes a little bit like what's going on here and why are they worried about this thing? Uh, but, but let me tell you why I think it's important because it, there's this one quality I think we need to see about Jesus' followers that we need to, we really need to succumb to. And this, this is what it is, okay? Peter starts off, he stands up and he said, we got to deal with this Judas situation. This guy went and sold out Jesus, literally, for 30 pieces of silver. He, he sold out Jesus. He betrayed him. What are we going to do about this? Because if we're going to be united, if we're going to be of one accord, we've got we to gotta go forward, all right? Th this is what he does. And this is what he says is this. We don't really need to worry about everything because God's got this taken care of. God foretold of all these things happening. This is what Peter is believing. I, I'm not sure that it is 100% sure or not, but it's God-breathed scripture. Why not? Why would it not be? But this guy named Judas, one of the 12 initial chosen disciples of Jesus, at the end of the story, he sells him out. He uh, goes out and betrays Jesus to the end of his life and ultimately takes his own life, right? That's where it gets gross and guts and all that stuff pouring out. So to what end is my question. Here in Acts 1, verse 20, Peter quotes two different psalms. Now, this is where I'll nerd out a little bit because this is where I think it's fascinating. He quotes these psalms in regards to this Judas situation, and he does it in this way. This first one is this. Uh, it comes from Psalm 69, and Peter reads By the way, this is the first time that we ever see. See, we, we've been through four different books of the life of Jesus. We never once see Peter quote Scripture. It's the first time he does it. He's forced into this leadership role 
or at least he steps up and says, I got this. And he starts quoting scripture. It's awesome. And he says this, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. Here's what he says. He goes, I've seen what David, King David had written in the Psalms. And I think this points to this situation for us, guys. The, the writer of Psalms, David, was betrayed. He, he was one time a fugitive from King Saul, the first king of Israel. And as he's on the run, he's got this guy named Doeg that is primarily a kind of a friend and, and, and ends up betraying David. And whenever he betrays David, David is furious. Not just because he's been betrayed, but because people lose their lives because of it. Now, Peter sees this situation like, hey, that looks very familiar. And I think, if I'm looking at this correctly, David pins this word in, in, in reference to his betrayer. In Peter's eyes, this betrayer is just like what Judas was, right? And he says, may his camp become desolate. So he's frustrated. And he says, God's got this, but don't worry about it. He's going to... No one's going to dwell in this desolate, dry area that this guy lived in. Okay, then he goes on to this other psalm. And this one, I think, makes more sense to us. But Psalm 109 says this, and Peter quotes it, Let another take his office. They're like, wow, this is like very specific here. Again, Peter sees this as David referring back to this betrayal. And whenever this guy got kicked out of that role this off, that Doeg had, he's like, David said, hey, we got to refill the spot. Just like, if someone back here was in a classroom and they were going to be hanging out with the kids, they come down with some virus and say, I can't be there, guess what we have to do? Someone else got to fill their spot. Uh, and th now, this is much bigger here. We're talking about one of the 12 apostles. But this is not much different of the principle of what David did. So in Peter's eyes, it's like if the son of David, which is what Jesus is called, said, hey, I want to fulfill these roles and choose these people, why should we not replace this role just like King David himself? And this is what I think. I think this is crazy because this may have been fresh in Peter's uh, vision because in Luke 22, remember Luke wrote Luke and Acts, right? In Luke 22, Jesus even refers to there's going to be a time when all the 12 tribes of Israel are, are represented, and he's talking to these 12 apostles. So in Peter's mind, he's like, maybe we should refill this if Jesus' whole idea of the 12 tribes. I, I don't know what's right and wrong there. All I know is that if it was notable for, for Jesus to say something about, then Peter says, hey, this is a desire for us to accomplish God's will here. Okay, this is what's going on. Ultimately, this is what I think it points to when it comes to the church. Difficult things, difficult situations, administration, or in your individual life, a lot of difficult decisions. I think this points to extraordinary surrender. We talk about community, we talk about prayer, but how big is surrender in your life? Because so many times what we're trying to do as individuals is how can I glean from my experience or my study or my expertise and we completely miss what God has in mind for us. Peter says, I'm not going to miss what Jesus had in mind. I'm not going to miss what King David had in mind and I'm not going to miss what God had in mind. And here's why I think that he doesn't miss it at all because what it comes down to is I don't know what to do. We're just going to roll the dice and figure out what's going on. I mean, hey, there's some cool things happening. There's all these believers that are walking uh, the earth with them. This is great. But he says, we need to find somebody who's been with Jesus and then let God decide. This is kind of cool, all right? So essentially when he says we're going to cast lots, you think hey, we're going to roll the dice and see where it goes. But I want you to think about like a pebbles in a bowl. You have these different colored pebbles, and uh, however they come out, and uh, however they fall, the, the lot fell towards Matthias, is what it says, okay? Details that don't matter. And, and honestly, don't go home and start rolling dice for all your decisions. Don't do it, okay? Don't go break out the Yahtzee and figure it out. Uh, or, any of you have those magic eight ball, you sinners? I'm just kidding. Uh, sometimes we're like, oh, I'm just going to leave it up to chance. No, you need to shower this with prayer first, and, and say, what in the world would Jesus do here? And I've gone as far as I can. Now I'm just going to put it in his hands. That's fine. Uh, carry your underwear. Jesus, take the will. All right, anyway. But what, what's going on, and I think you need to understand here, there is a surrender. There's like, I don't need to be in control of this anymore. Let me just cast it to God. Now, 
we never see casting lots anymore in the rest of the history of the church. We don't see it. Uh, and, and I think that might be learning something because they had a method of doing something that they completely abandoned. From here on, you see this was all Holy Spirit said this, Holy Spirit pointed here, and this baptism of the Holy Spirit showed them to do things in ways that they didn't need to cast lots. They were impacted in the heart, okay? This, to me, is this whole utopian idea of what the church can be. When we put our trust and total surrender in Jesus, you have ordinary, unnamed people, these 120 people, that are becoming extraordinary witnesses for Jesus. I love this imagery. As, as I kind of wrap this up, I want you to understand how important this is. Because I truly believe, you and me both, the lot has been cast to us. Now, m- maybe there wasn't a figurative rolling of the dice and said, no, you're going to be in this position here. But the lot has been cast to you. How, how do I know that? Because you have accept- if you are a follower of Jesus, you have accepted his mission to be his witness. That means the lot has been cast to you. And you may be unnamed in our society. You, you may be very ordinary, and that's fine. So was Matthias. So was this other guy that didn't get the apostleship. All these people are unordinary, unnamed. You don't even read Matthias's name the rest of the book of Acts. That's how unimportant or unordinary he is. But the lot has been cast towards you. And the lot has been cast to me. And our question today is, what are you going to do with it? You can't just read it for some historical narrative that it might be. You need to see it with the importance of where we are in this today. Because in 2023, when you're talking about being an extraordinary church, an extraordinary family, you have been called just like I have. So what do we do with that today? Let's pray. God, thank you so much again for including us in your plan. The, the lot has fallen, and we have the choice to respond. That's the beauty of this, God, is that you include us by giving us a choice to respond. And as scary as that could be sometimes, God, I, I don't think it needs to be. Because when we put our trust in the community you provide, when we put our trust in the method of prayer that has been clearly advantageous for all of us, and we put our full and complete trust and surrender to you, God, you show us a way. You continue to show us a way day in, day out. And I thank you for, for being completely faithful to us at all times, not leaving us in the dark, not leaving us to guess, but for showing us the way. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.